Good afternoon, everybody. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is a great turnout tonight. Um, all of Beth's family and friends. Came. <laughs> I see how it works. It's like padding the numbers. That's good. Uh, and she brought ammo, so that's also good. Yeah, to wake up. Um, anyways, so uh, welcome. Is this the last one, Samantha? No, it's not. Okay. I'll tell you more about that at the end when Samantha reminds me of who else is talking. Um, but tonight, uh, Beth Ferraro is talking to us, and so let's begin with a prayer, and then I'll hand it over to Beth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us to help us hear what we need to hear, to learn what we need to learn. And we ask this through the intercession of our Blessed Mother as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Father. Thanks, Father. Um, so I'm really, really nervous. And I always say this to high schoolers because obviously this is a Catholic group because no one's in the front. But I do, I, I, I do always wear deodorant. So if, if that was your fear for moving back, like I, I, I promise it smells good up here. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, it, you know, uh, it, it is, I'm used to talking to teenagers and I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, more difficult talking to uh, people that I know really well. So, um, yeah, so I'm just going to talk about my faith journey, and really it's via theology of the body. And uh, I guess my theme and uh, what I try to, um, if, if I've had your kids before, then I'm sure they say that Mrs. Farr is always yelling at us. I'm not yelling at them. I'm passionate about the subject matter, right? But uh, what I want to... I have lots of different sayings, and one of them is that chastity is a gift, not a punishment. And I think culturally speaking, and certainly our kids are part of that culture, that they believe that chastity is a punishment for them um, rather than a great gift from God, right, a virtue um, that lets us um, live our lives um, according to God's plan. Um, I love, um, so Theology of the Body was written by Pope, uh, now it's St. John Paul the Great, but I love this quote from Pope Benedict, and many people perceive Christianity as something institutional rather than an encounter with Christ, which explains why they don't see it as a source of joy. Um, and uh, Monsignor Pope, and maybe you remember, he was here and did a mission at, at Blessed Sacrament one time, and um, he said, as a priest, you should see people's faces when they walk into church. He said, it looks like they're dragging their kids into juvie or they're on their way to prison. Um, and he said, we, it, you're, going to mass is supposed to be a source of joy, right? And um, so I'll never forget that he said that. And um, I kind of asked students, like, how do your parents get you up to come to mass? You know, if, you have, if, if your parents even make you go to mass, right? And they're always like, um, you know, they turn on the light. Hey, come on, you got to get up. We have to go to mass. Let's go. Um, and... It, Okay, that's not a source of joy, right? So um, I do think that, and I certainly did, saw faith as obligatory, right? This is something that we're supposed to do and that we, we um, do this thing on Sunday um, and we throw in a few rote prayers every once in a while and then that's it, right? And so it's, an inst it, it's more institutional rather than a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And I would say that theology of the body is what helped me develop that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And now my faith is a source of great joy. And I would say that my um, uh, faith is a source of uh, great joy in my marriage relationship and then um, also with my kids. Um, uh, I, I always believe, so it's kind of um, growing up, and I'll show you a little bit about my family in, in, in a second, but um, growing up, I did believe in Jesus, right? I did believe in the real presence of the Eucharist. I did believe, right, I knew that the Catholic faith was the one true church of Jesus Christ. Um, and I wanted to love Jesus, but I also wanted to have fun. And I thought that Jesus and fun were incompatible terms. <laughs> or, or certainly the Catholic faith and fun, you know, they do not equal each other. Um, and so that was really hard for me because I like having fun. Um, and, and still enjoy having fun. Um, however, in a, in a holy way now with, that has, um, that reflects that I do love Jesus and I, and I have him as part of my life. Um, I will say that there are peers uh, that I knew in high school and college that were very surprised 
Um, first of all, that I decided to become a teacher, but then really surprised um, when I switched to teaching religion and um, in particularly uh, theology of the body. Um, so just my, um, that's my saying that like I really did, I wanted to be Catholic um, as, a, as a teenager, loved my faith in grade school and middle school, um, uh, high school and college, that was certainly the challenge. And so, you know what I mean? Like, um, like some of my, well, my favorite picture of the Blessed Virgin Mary, because um, she's young. She actually looks Jewish, right? Not German. Um, and I, I love that picture of Jesus, like, running out of the tomb there. It's um, Liz Lamont Swindle, and I love that painting. Um, but some of the things that bring me great joy today. Um, and so I, I know that it is very possible to love our faith, love Jesus, um, and enjoy life at the same time. So, um, uh, in my, um, in my family of origin, right, um, uh, grew up in Wichita and I'm the fifth of nine children. Um, I've been married to Claudio for, it'll be 33 years in May. Um, we've always practiced, um, Natural family planning, because I, I did know that hormonal contraception was not um, good for women's health. And then neither one of us wanted to use any barrier methods in our, in our married intimacy. So intellectually, again, um, I knew that Catholicism was rational. Um, God and nature always concur, um, but still obligatory. Um, still that very um, practicing my faith obediently and as an obligation. Um, so I would say that we were living a good life, but not a truly joyous um, type of life. So like I said, some background information for you. So um, uh, that's my family. That's my old, our oldest daughter's wedding. And, and now since then, it's grown. Now there's about 30 plus people missing from that picture. Um, so five of nine, there's seven girls and two boys in my family. Um, I'm the middle child, so the very shy and forgotten child. Um, <laughs> That's um, Claudio and I uh, have an amazing life together, right? So our oldest daughter, Cabrini, is married to Ryan Swick. That's our oldest granddaughter, and um, she's in heaven. Um, this is, oh, my gosh, grandparenting. Oh, oh, it's the best. It's the best thing in the world. Um, so that's Elizabeth Blaze. Um, this is Assunta Lucia Zwick. That's an Italian-German name, right, put together. Um, th that's their, uh, our second granddaughter, um, then Gabby and Chris, and they're here. They were have been married for a year um, in December. Giovanni is our only son. Uh, he's getting ready to graduate from Benedictine and go uh, head off to dental school. And then our youngest daughter is Isabella. And they even say it, not me, but last child, best child, um, which is usually not the case, I have to say, as a teacher. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> In, in her case, it's, it's true, an easy child to raise. Um, so, oops, whoops, got to go back here. <laughs> yeah, I went back way too far there. Sorry, go back here. Hit the... And is he? Okay, here we go. Um, so I was uh, 30, year, uh, 30 years old. My, my mom, Mary Murtis, is the one who first told me about theology of the body. And she had this set of um, CDs, okay? And if you're, I know people here probably do know what these are. High school students don't know what these are. Um, there's 10 of them. And this is not the original one because I gave that one away a long time ago. I passed it on to other people. So um, she was bothering me all the time. Um, Beth, I think you need to listen to this. I think you need to listen to this. And um, like my siblings are here, so they all know this. But our mom and dad love to read to us, mostly our dad. Um, I hate when people read to me. Um, but he is always trying to get us to, to read. And in this case, she was trying to get me to listen to these CDs. And um, I told her mom, there is no way I have time to listen to those CDs. Um, I, I had two little kids, um, a two-year-old and a baby, and I was teaching middle school English at Resurrection, and I did not have time to listen to these, to these uh, CDs. But she kept bothering me, and she kept bothering me, and so one day I was driving home from daycare, and our, our babysitter lived in um, just past College Hill, and so I'm like, okay, whatever, I'll put it in here so she'll stop bothering me. Um, so I put them in, and then I couldn't stop listening to it, and then I just drove around Wichita, and... Um, uh, Gabby and Cabrini finally stopped crying in the back seat, and they fell asleep. And uh, but I, I I I listened to five of them. Um, that's before cell phones. That's the other thing, right? Didn't have a cell phone until I was forty. Children can't believe that you can live that long, 
right, without a cell phone. Um, but Claudio was used to me not sticking to a schedule, so he wasn't that surprised um, that I was home so late. But um, uh, went home, uh, talked to him about it. Obviously, we got takeout because I wasn't going to make dinner after that. And um, then when, after I was finished with the first CD, I said, okay, I, gotta, I can't teach English anymore. I have to teach this. Because our kids, ugh, that choked me up a little bit, right? Um, after teaching middle school, most of the time, I spent um, my time talking to teenagers about what love is and what love looks like and why modesty is a good thing um, and why you're not supposed to have a boyfriend when you're in the sixth grade. Um, and, and so instead of teaching English, I was teaching those. I'm like, okay, well, now I got to do this. Um, thanks a lot, Mom. And, um, but I did. Uh, so it's kind of how I, and then it's a long story to, to um, getting there uh, to where I actually could be able to teach theology of the body. I love this quote by Christopher West. So um, um, John, his, like John Paul II's book, on, and this is about my fifth one that I've owned, but like this is his writing, and John Paul II is a genius, and I'm not. So um, when you read his, it's a very difficult read. It's beautiful, but it's difficult. And so I find... Um, Certainly myself, and then the one who, certainly my first teacher in person, too, was Christopher West. So um, I love what he says, brace yourself. If we take in what the Holy Father is saying in his theology of the body, we will never view ourselves, view others, view the church, the sacraments, grace, God, heaven, marriage, the celibate, vocation. We will never view the world the same way again. And he was right. Um, uh, amazingly um, correct. Uh, and that genius of St. John Paul the Great um, literally uh, inspired my intellect. And when I really did allow Jesus into the depths of my soul, um, it was life changing. And I, I, you know, I would say that I believe Jesus was the son of God, but until you let him into your soul, you don't, you know what I mean? The feeling of it is Life-changing, and then it has to change your life. You have to act differently. Um, can't be the same way. And in some ways, oh, that's hard. Uh, really hard to kind of change the way that you've been living your life. Um, I cannot even explain uh, the joy that it brought to my life. Um, you know, sometimes, like, God, I don't know why I'm getting choked up, you know? Um, because I'm not a crier. Uh, Claudio and I will look at each other some nights, right? And we said, I cannot believe that this is our life. You know, I, I cannot believe the life that we have uh, and the blessings that we have. Um, th there is just no expression for it. And we are so flawed. Uh, we've made so many mistakes. And yet, um, you know, God's blessing is amazing. Um, yeah, so now I know this kind of funny one here. And um, I always, like... I show kids pictures of me because I'm not weird that I love Jesus. I still do know how to have fun. Um, and well, I guess some of those are kind of weird. That one with Father Curtis, right? Um, it, it, just some of the things that, that were life-changing for me. And, and I would say that certainly as a teenager that I did um, view chastity um, as a punishment and not as a, a liberating gift um, on how to express our human sexuality. Um, and when I learned about um, sexual morality, and probably I would say a lot of you in, this, in, in the room the same as me, uh, we learned it as a list of what not to do. You're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to do this. These are the sins. Like, here's chastity, and here's a list of sins. Um, that's not what chastity is. Oh, perfect. Yeah. That's, it, it's a, a great and amazing gift. Um, it's a freeing gift. It shows us how to love people. And John Paul II says, there's no way you can understand the virtue of chastity if you don't know how to love. It's impossible to practice chastity if, if you don't really know what love is. So, um, you know, I, I, that, was, that was so freeing uh, when he starts w w just reading about, like, what, what chastity is not. So it's not just the avoidance of sexual or other types of intercourse um, or the avoidance of masturbation. Um, it's not centered on negatives or a list of what not to do. Um, it's not handcuffs. 
because actually it's liberating. Um, it's not impossible because if it was impossible, then Jesus would be a jerk. And Jesus Christ is not a jerk. Um, and it's not an empty promise. So, well, like really in a, in a, in a nutshell, right? Chastity is the proper use of our human sexuality according to God's design. It's the, sec- it's the successful integration of sexuality within the human person. It's practiced in every vocation. Um, all vocations are called to love and life. It's ordering our sexual desires according to the demands of real love. And today we kind of have that slippery slope sexual morality in our culture. Um, well, if this is okay, this is okay. And if this is okay, well, then must, this must be okay. And, you know, we have game night every night with our mom and dad. And it, you know what I mean? When you're talking about the transgender issue and, and, and bisexual men being able to swim in women's sports, like my, uh, swim in women's sports, right? And our mom and dad are laughing, like, how could this even possibly be reality? that we live in today, but that's what happens when you have the slippery slope mentality of human sexuality. Um, uh, It's recognizing that our sexuality is a great gift from God. It's integral to who we are. It's not a separate sidebar piece of us. Um, To the depths of our core, we're masculine and feminine. It's a great and amazing gift. We view the world as men and women, and our sexuality is um, a great gift, and we need each other. Men were created for women and vice versa. Um, it's, it's only lived out with the help of grace. You cannot do it without God's grace. It's impossible. So we need a relationship with God. Um, it's interesting because the um, deacon wrote about this too. Um, so we're called to be mystics like the saints were, right? It's, and and um, what... Christopher West says, and I cut off his name there, but living the Christian life is not a matter of regressing, of repressing our desires. That is stoic, Um, but it's of redeeming them. That's what mysticism means. Um, And it's not addictive, meaning that I, um, that I come up, that I become obsessed with the pleasure that's involved with um, human sexuality. Um, and, And, and just, you know, some of the things when, when I'm, um, and people laugh sometimes too when I say that I really do teach or sometimes people say oh you teach you teach abstinence to teenagers and I'm like nope I don't teach abstinence to teenagers I teach mm-hmm. chastity to teenagers and I know there's people out there that will say that's an impossible task um, it sure as hell is impossible for Beth Ferraro but it's not impossible for Jesus Christ um, and the Holy Spirit and our kids need it. Um, you know what I mean? One in four teenagers in the United States of America has an active STD. Um, it's the number, the misuse of our human sexuality is the number one reason for children living in poverty in the United States of America. I know what our culture says the answer is. I know the culture says the answer is condoms and the answer is abortion. Well, we've had those things since the 60s, or, well, an abortion since the 70s, and those things aren't getting better. Um, the greater number of sex partners outside of marriage, the greater your chances are for divorce. Um, and then of course we have abortion, mainstream cohabitation, um, and, and children giving, given puberty blockers. Um, and again, right now the big issue is the transgender issue. And I've kind of been through all of them. I'm tired of paying, playing catch up, um, with our kids um, I think when I, when I very first started teaching theology of the body, I would say that there were a lot of kids at Cape and that would say they were pro-choice. So I'd say abortion was the big issue. It's not anymore. The vast majority of our kids say they're pro-life. Um, right. And there's certainly there's, um, the contraception issue, uh, in vitro fertilization, um, artificial insemination. Now that, um, same sex marriage, same sex attraction, um, and the difference between those two things. Uh, the beauty about theology of the body is God doesn't hate anyone. Uh, every one of us in this room, every human being was created for salvation. Um, and none of us are saved without God's mercy. So God's mercy and forgiveness, um, is so abundant and so beautiful. And I sure as heck, um, am going to need it to be able to get to heaven. So it is not about, it's not about condemnation. It's about salvation. Uh, of the human person. Except, except 
we are having question and answer. Yeah, we're going to have Q&A later. That uh, will not be recorded, so we can ask the good stuff. Oh, good. And, yeah. and, we, and we do have prizes if you ask questions. What? We do? This is what happens. You know, with, um, with Beth, you always know you're going to get a good talk, but you always got to be careful because you got to be ready for a chastity talk. <laughs> She's so passionate about this, right? And so um, the things we've, what we've been doing this whole time is we're looking at people's stories and what really got them to know who Jesus Christ was, what really was their encounter with him that brought them into the fold, so to speak, right? And so, so you know, Beth, she was talking, and she's like so many of us, like me even, you know, we go through the motions when we're younger. We do this because this is what we're supposed to do. And that can sustain you for a long time, but it, it won't work forever, you know? And so what was it for Beth you know, that encounter was those CDs, right? Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ spoke to her in a way we don't often think about Jesus speaking to us, and it's through our intellect. We don't often think about Jesus talking to us through this amazing intellectual teaching that someone from the church, you know, St. Pope John Paul II or St. John Paul the Great, whatever we're calling him, right, he brought this teaching forward and it speaks to people and it changes something in their minds and then it forces that change in the heart too because she mentioned that too, right? It, it wasn't in her heart until that point. And when it was in her heart now, it forces you to react to it. It forces you to respond, right? Because when we have that encounter with Jesus Christ, it sets us on fire and we want to share that with people because we've seen the good and we want them to have it too. Love is not something that can be contained, right? It's something that we share. And that's kind of the whole point of theology of the body is it's all about love, you know, uh, now, certain relationships have different kinds of love, obviously, right? But love is something that we share with one another and we can't put it in a box. And so when the love of God comes into our hearts, it goes to everyone around us. And it's through that love of God, through that encounter with him, that we will also experience true freedom, Right. And so, you know, chastity is a gift, not a punishment. Like, you know, if Beth Ferraro had a tagline, that's the one. Right. But it's also about freedom. Oftentimes, you know, exactly. We think about the church and her list of rules. Right. And I like to think of them more as the lines on the side of the road. <laughs> if you go beyond the lines on the side of the road, you're going to get in trouble. I can tell you from experience because I've gone flying in my car when I get off the road because I went past the line, like literally flying. I had to get a new car. It was not fun. It was exciting, but not fun. <laughs> but the church gives us the lines and we're free to do so much within those. And it's amazing the joy you can find in your heart. When you allow the love of God into your heart, when you, when you do what he asks you to do because he created us, you find that fulfillment that you can't find anywhere else. Um, and so, yeah, uh, sometimes I have a little bit more prepared, but that's, that's what I got tonight. The, so that's the little theological reflection-y bit for tonight. Um, what we do now is we'll, yeah, huh? Yeah. I thought, oh, I thought that was Beth. <laughs> Getting thrown off tonight. <laughs> um, so what we do now, we take a little bit of a break. Um, so it's usually till about a quarter after, right, Samantha? Samantha's the real boss here. We all know that. So, um, so we're going to take a break until about um, 7.15. 
and uh, then we'll come back for about 15 minutes of Q&A, and I'll be here for most of that, but then I gotta go set up adoration real quick. So after the Q&A then, we get to go spend time with this God who has enlightened us in so many ways and brought us all this joy. Uh, and the next talk, uh, we'll give you the ad again later maybe, is uh, Andy Chere, which will be April 19th on a Tuesday at 6 p.m. is when it starts, right? Yeah, that's what she wrote on the paper, so uh, I assume it's right. Um, so thank you all for coming, and we'll... Father, I am going to interrupt you for one second. Okay. Because um, it just reminded me of something else that I was going to say, but um, I think the other thing with, like, the, how the culture in, influences our kids, and uh, certainly with pornography, that's a huge problem, but um, with moral relativism, and I am so grateful um, to God and to my parents that, I did know that there was truth. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus really did, or the church really did appeal to my intellect, but I think you need both. I think it needs to be your head and your heart. And, um, but we live in a culture today that says there's no truth. So moral relativism says you get to pick what your truth is. So now we have kids, even, even if Jesus is trying to appeal their intellect, they live in a culture that says, no, you get, you, there is no source of truth. Mm. So your church is not a source of your truth. Your faith is not a source of truth. You're your own source of truth. Uh, then they really get, then that silver slip, then they really get, you know, mm -hmm. led down the rabbit hole because your feelings dictate your mm -hmm. truth versus your feelings mm -hmm. are supposed to influence your, your intellect, but your feelings are amoral. There's no morality to your feelings. Mm -hmm. But, but slippery slope mentality says, no, your feelings direct your will and you direct your own truth. So, um, yeah, we got to talk to our kids and our mm -hmm. grandkids and yeah. anybody that we possibly can. There, it, you know, the, uh, the Christendom and the apostolic thing, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure that people have talked about that too, but uh, there was a time when I think parents thought, well, my kids will come back to the faith. And I would say that a lot of us did. Mm -hmm. That's not the case anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, sorry. It's okay. She can't shut it off. It's okay. Um, but it's good, right? So there's a lot of things we can do there, but one of the things that, that does cut through even that, right, that can cut through even when people can't perceive the truth is the joy and the love from our relationship with God, right? Um, so that is one of those things that will cut through. Um, one of the things that I've been telling parents for a minute now, um, since uh, about a year ago when I f thought of it, <laughs> I'm sure I stole it from somebody, right? Everything good we stole from somebody. Right? <laughs> um, share your faith with the people around you. And that's what we're doing here tonight. We're sharing the story of how we came to our faith. Because then you can see this is how it worked for them, and this is why they're joyful. And I can have that in my own life because this person is like me. Um, you know, so, so parents, share your faith with your kids. Kids, share with your parents. I don't know, right? Um, but it's these stories and that human connection that we have with one another and being able to see the joy in people's lives that, that will start to turn that corner. And it's the reason that we can still be hopeful in a world that's seriously messed up, you know? So, all right. Um, so can I let them have a break now? Yeah. Okay. So take a break. We'll be back at 715 and come up with some good questions because, you know, you got us. <laughs> so.